Hey, hello friends. Thank you for joining me again today. My name is Dan. And I've been painting up in my studio for several minutes before I decided, wait a minute, <laughs> I should share this. So here we are, the day after Christmas. Happy day after Christmas to all of you. Hope you had a great day. We did, very sweet time with a minimum, minimum, not, not, nothing worth mentioning, <laughs> minimum of family drama. Nothing, oh, anyway. This is Daily Art Adventure number 798, Woohoo! and I've called it uh, Storytelling Style. Some of you uh, may know, and the rest of you I'll tell you. <laughs> um, this is, for me, this is a throwback for me. There was a time about 20 years ago when I just really loved this, this fantasy is what it's usually called, but I, I call it storytelling artwork. Um, it fits my personality very well because I also like telling stories, I like writing stories, and something I haven't done much of in the last several years, but used to do a fair amount. And, um, this painting I, I did um, this past Thursday for a church Christmas party banquet. So at the, at the function, at the Christmas party, I painted, hang on a second, I don't think I want those brushes, I want these brushes. I painted in acrylics, um, s did about two hours, two hours and 10 or 15 minutes maybe to do all of this. And I'm assuming you can see, let me move you around a little bit. So it started out, you know, I did two paintings this past weekend, uh, Thursday and Tuesday, and they're similar. So I sort of like got uh, the painting A and painting B. And this is painting A. Um, so there's a, a silhouette of a, a Christus, a Jesus on the cross here. There's a waterfall, a cosmic waterfall coming out of the heart of him in space down. And then it gradually turns into a landscape. All kinds of things, of course, that can't happen in real life. You can do in fantasy painting where here I have what are like cloud nebula evolving into clouds. Of course, in real life, <laughs> that doesn't happen even close, <laughs> right? You can, never, you can never set yourself on any mountain in this planet, in this universe, where you can see cloud nebula turn into clouds. But in, in the world of fantasy, you can just do things like that. Um, and, then, uh, and then down here, I, it, it was a Christmas party. So, so I thought I was going to do, you know, the manger scene, Jesus, Joseph, Mary, shepherds, something like that, um, but um, when I do, often when I do these kinds of live event paintings, especially for a, any kind of spiritual or church group, um, I often don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I literally get up there and start painting often without, without knowing where I'm going. That certainly was the case in both of these paintings that I did this past week. So I thought I was going to, but at the last minute, it's like, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, this is not a manger scene. So I have a shepherd man. I, I need to clean him up. A couple sheep and a shepherd standing. And this, these, this was, these were like bodies of water, like lakes. And then they got turned into cities, which is really cool. And uh, just, for, you know, I, I said this at the time, I... I, I obligate myself, so to speak, I oblig obligate myself to do the painting. Um, I do not obligate myself to give the um, infallible interpretation, if you will. Um, I, I hand that privilege, responsibility, freedom over to the people. Uh, there, there's... I'm, of course, very familiar with 
uh, all kinds of, of Christian symbols, you know, waterfall, cleansing, water of life, river of life, you know, all kinds of things could be, of course, a cross and a shepherd and so uh, even in the light. And so all of those things are uh, symbols pregnant with meaning and and I am uh, very content to let, let the people uh, come up with their own. In fact, uh, several people came up to me. Now, here, <laughs> by the way, here's the way this works. Very typically, uh, several people came up to me and gave me their interpretation, some of which inwardly, mind you, not outwardly, but inwardly <laughs> kind of made me roll my eyes. <laughs> it's like, nah. Um, <laughs> and that, that's all right. I didn't let them know my eyes were rolling inwardly. <laughs> um, but by the same token, uh, several people came up and gave me uh, interpretations, if you will, of the painting that rocked my socks. It's like, whoa, dude, that is just, or dudette. <laughs> that is just awesome, man. That's better than what I was, that's better than what I was thinking. So it's great fun. I really enjoy it. And the reason I decided to go ahead and, and start uh, broadcasting was, again, because it, it gives us a chance, gives me a chance to show you um, a different side of myself. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna take a few minutes as I paint to describe for you, what is the difference between this and my normal painting? So. My normal painting, I, the, the style label I put on it, which I got from David LaFell, one of them big dog painters. He, he calls his stuff, ab, he, he calls his stuff abstract realism. And, and I heard that several years ago and said, Shazam, that's it, that's it, that's perfect. That's what mine is. But this, this here, this is not abstract realism, okay? So in abstract, re oh, I'm trying to decide. So should I go into the big picture? Okay, yeah, I will. Here, here, oh, big picture real quickly. Um, I think the ideal art journey is this. Not everybody goes through this, but I think this is an ideal, ideal way to develop as an artist. You spend the first half, and by half, I mean period. I don't mean halvesies, halvesies. Um, you spend the first half of your art journey learning how to paint stuff that looks like stuff. Okay, that, I think that's really important. And as I've said so many times, I think that's basically all that college age students should do for the most part, is just learn how to paint stuff that looks like stuff. And of course, you understand that, when, that I'm flying in the face of virtually every art department in the Western world when I say that, but that doesn't matter. Um, in a hundred years, you, you will know that I'm right. <laughs> we are living in a bubble of time where certain things are in and certain things are out. And I just dabble enough in history to know, to know that over the course of time, different things come in and go out. So anyway, so even though I'm, I'm out of step with my current generation sits in Laban. I am I am looking at the broad sweep of history and quite convinced that this little bubble that we're living in right now, twentieth century twenty and I'm not saying twenty first, you under recognize. Twentieth century modern art will be seen as a bubble, as a strange as it recedes into history. It will be viewed as a very peculiar bubble in, in art history. Anyway, uh, how did I get onto that? <laughs> So, um, my normal painting is abstract. Oh, that's right. I was saying that the ideal art journey is uh, first half of your journey, learn how to paint stuff that looks like stuff, which is basically what I'm doing here, even though it looks like fantasy stuff. But still, I want this to look like a waterfall, I want this to look like a sunset, I want this to look like a distant uh, landscape vista, you know, pine trees. <laughs> how am I doing on the pine trees? Pretty good? <laughs> palm trees and star universe, you know? So um, I'm, right now I'm painting as if in the first half of our journey. 
Second half of Art Journey, then, you, not everybody makes the jump. I think everybody should, but not everybody does, and that's all right. I am not the boss of the world, the, even the art world. So people that don't that persist in, in realism, super realism, photo realism, hyper realism, whatever you want to call it, that's all right. I am not in charge of their life. They're more than free to do whatever they want. But I think the ideal journey is to graduate to the point where you recognize that painting paintings is about paint. I'm not pointing at this particular painting. It's about paint. I should point at my palette down there. It's about paint, not about pictures. Okay. All right. So that's that's the big picture. And again, 20 years ago, I was thoroughly in the paint purdy pictures camp, uh, and I, I enjoyed it quite much. I I have thought often, you know, if if I had gotten quote unquote famous and made a lot of good money selling a painting, selling and painting and selling fantasy or storytelling art, I probably would have stayed there. Honestly, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> but the fact is I did not make a lot of money. <laughs> so that forced me to grow and develop as an artist. And I, little by little, I began to discover, oh, you know what? It's not about painting pretty pictures. It's about paint on canvas. Now, at that point, see, me and the 20th century gang agree, concur, Perfectly, me and and uh, I was gonna say Clive Bell, yeah, Greenberg. Here's I'm looking over here at my. Let me here, okay. Since I'm playing around with you, here's my stash of of art books, some of my art books, and here's here's the one. Here's the here's the the grumpass, um, grumpiest, and biggest. Uh, uh, Clement Greenberg, critic um, of 20th century art. And uh, I have my notes in it, my scribbles, and my notes on the front. <laughs> anyway, so he and I agree on this point that it's not about pictures, it's about paint. We, we, we disagree on virtually everything else, <laughs> but on that we agree. <laughs> in my opinion now it is about paint all right so where was I going with that um, so the difference between painting even the way that I'm painting now and the way that I normally paint in my abstract realist technique is that right now My focus is almost entirely on creating illusion with my brushes, with my paint. Okay, like right now, I want this to look like, you know, a high atmosphere, part of a cloud with the sun hitting. I want it to look like a cloud with sun on it. Does that make, make sense? Whereas if I were an abstract realist, that would be a secondary concern. My primary concern would be um, making interesting marks. See, there you go. So my concern today with this style painting is not so much making interesting marks. It's much more about creating the illusion. Um, and in case you wonder, yeah, this is great fun. It is, it is great fun. I love it. Um, um, in my mind, there is no question that this style of painting is much, much easier. In other words, first half of art journey is introductory, where you're, you, you're not worried so much about interesting marks. You're interested about similitude, realism, copying, the, the illusion. See, isn't, isn't that pretty right there? A little bit of sun tucking in behind that. See, I sound like Bob Ross there a little bit, don't I? That is not an accident that I sound like Bob Ross. Because that's what, that's what he was about. And I, I love Bob Ross, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. He had a wonderful TV program, and I enjoy watching it. Just enjoyed 
past tense and still enjoy it about as much as anybody. But was he a good painter? No. <laughs> well, I, no, people always say, was you, no, they don't say. Whenever somebody asks me, was Bob Ross a good painter? The answer is, heck if I know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was. But did he do good painting on his TV show? No, 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 no. No, I'm being a bit of a snob there. I, not just a bit. I'm being actually. I'm being being a bit of a professor more than a snob. So do not. Now, okay. Here's a good question. If you want to start being a painter, then is it appropriate, say, to copy the Bob Ross or to imitate the Bob Ross style? The answer is in the first half of your art journey, absolutely. I think everybody. Yeah, no, this is an exaggeration. Okay. Everybody should go through their Bob Ross period. Everybody should go through their Norman Rockwell period. Everybody should go through their William Bouguereau period. Some of you don't even know who William Bouguereau is. Go look him up. B O U G E A U R O A A U W. No, no, no W at the end. <laughs> it's French. So all you have to remember with French language is that all letters are silent. <laughs> That's all you have to remember. Bouguereau. Start spelling boo, B-O-U-G-E-A, William, and, your, and Google will take it from there. <laughs> and he'll say, yeah, that's what I meant, him. <laughs> um, so once again, let me go back to, is this fun? Heck yeah, it, it really is. And, and is it easy? Yeah. It really is. Now, well, let me try to be really, <laughs> let me try to be really honest. <laughs> oh no, has it come to that? Has it come to that, Mr. Dan? Oh no, honesty, God help us. <laughs> um, I, I do wonder, is it easy for me because I have a certain set of talents? No, I think it's easy for me because indeed, I do have a set of talents that I have honed over the years. So in other words, copying and doing real. So in other words, I successfully passed. I successfully um, got past the first half of the art journey, which is I developed the ability to copy stuff, to paint stuff that looks like stuff really well. So because I'm past that, then uh, realism is indeed very easy for me because I, I, I can look at some of my you know, fellow painters, early journey painters, and they say, well, it's easy for you to say. It's not easy for me. And I go, yeah, 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 I know. That's, that's right. That's because you're still in the first half of your journey, as you ought to be. Nothing wrong with that. And then several people, Jane, I think you asked in particular down in Charlotte, Jane asked, well, wait, if it's too late for me, <laughs> I want to go straight to the second half. Can I, can I skip to the second half? And in fact, yes, I, I taught a class at Art of the Carolinas a couple months ago called um, Abstracting Your Way to, um, to Good Realistic Painting. And I will, in one of these days, I'm going to put that whole teaching on YouTube so that the rest of you can perhaps drive some benefit from that. All right, you guys are chatting up a storm over here. Najavit Vats, thank you very much. Navjit. I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> and Uncle, I, have, I ate too many Christmas cookies yesterday. Hello, Nelly. Hello, Sketch. Hello, a oh, lot of new people this morning. Hello, Lady Grammy. Hello, Karen, <laughs> a few old timers. Uh, Sketch, yes, thank you very much. Yes, we are in oils. Thank you, Karen. Yes, yes, yes. And Who is, oh yeah, who is a starry, starry night? Um, Don McLean, um, Josh Groban did a very beautiful and popular uh, re-recording of Starry, Starry Night. Yeah, in fact, in fact, <laughs> that that comparison. <laughs> this is a picture. I I usually say the word wrongly. I pronounce it wrong on purpose. The real word is picture. A pit. Picture is, I mispronounce it just, I don't know, be ornery, I don't know, to make the point. Anyway, this is a picture of Starry Night. Um, uh, Vincent Van Gogh's painting of uh, Starry Night. See, he was thoroughly in the second half of his art journey, right? I love Van Gogh. 
Was he a good painter? Oh, yeah. He was a good painter. Freaking genius. Uh, you know, almost no training. Just, anyway, he came out of nowhere. Hello, Lady Grammy. Yes, we had a delightful, delightful. Thank you, and fa thank Francis Don McLean. And, uh, Thank you, Barbara. Said I did a fabulous job at the church. Wonderful paintings. Thank you very much. Um, they, the, uh, the, the two of them are <laughs> quite similar, <laughs> as you saw. Uh, I guess, what do you expect? I mean, you do two paintings almost back to back, of the, both for Christmas, both for churches at Christmas. All right, I'm mixing up a paler yellow now. I, I really have to be careful not to, not to um, spend too, too, too much time on these paintings. First of all, I, it'd be easy to just go overboard. I think that, that atmosphere is one of the most important aspects of the, of the scene of the painting. Everything else, I can go a little bit more abstract. So now I want to create this fun illusion that this cosmic waterfall up here, cosmic waterfall, is turning into sunset. The, the two meld together. So you can't quite tell where the waterfall ends and the sunset starts. Does that sound like fun? Sounds like fun to me. Last week, the one evening when I was relaxing, I uh, was watching YouTube and um, came across this Russian guy. Everything, everything he wrote was in Russian, so he, he, didn't even, he wasn't even translated in English. But he was a painter, and he, he does fairly large, maybe this big maybe, uh, very... Uh, Pretty. I'm trying to think of the right term. I'm not not trying to be critical. A very pretty, pretty, pretty um, landscapes. Romantic landscapes. You know, gorgeous sunset. Big, big, kind of like this. Gorgeous sunset and mountains and clouds and foothills and gorgeous trees and a and a beautiful lake with reflection, uh, ducks on the lake, or <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I thought maybe I should, maybe I should go, maybe I should do one of those for, for my YouTube people. Um, Oh, a little bit of static there. Side gang, you go. Um, just to <laughs> okay. P p the bad part is to show you that I can. <laughs> I am not embracing that as a good motive. <laughs> um, there's no question that there's a significant segment of the population. Significant 
20%, 25% maybe, significant percent of the population that is, is never going to get um, abstract realism. They're never going to get impressionistic paintings. There's a certain percentage of the population, including a certain percentage of artists, of course, who are just never going to get this abstract thing. Um, to them, a good painting is one that looks real. And I can understand that, sort of. <laughs> anyway, so as I was I watched this guy, and I, f I found myself really enjoying watching it, I felt like I could, I could uh, identify with virtually every stroke that he made. It's like, yep, yep, that's right. That's what I would have done. Yep, yep. Because, again, because it goes back, to a, goes back to a former life of mine. But here I am sort of doing the same thing. Um, not uh, much more quickly than what he was doing, but um, just doing this painting stuff that looks like stuff. That's really the best way to put it. And again, it is a, a phase of the journey that I heartily recommend. I really do. Um, So let me talk a little bit about, I mentioned Jane. Jane's probably not watching right now. I don't, she hasn't said anything. One of our regulars, Jane down in Charlotte. And she's bought actually several of my abstract paintings and I think some non-abstract as well. I'm sorry, Jane, I can't remember. But I know she's bought several of my abstract. And, and she asked the question some time ago when I was going on about this first and second half of the art journey. Jane paints, and she was feeling a little bit like, well, come on, what happens if, you know, I feel like I'm a little bit too old to go back and, you know, be a college student, learn how to paint stuff again. So, you know, is there hope for me? She didn't say that exactly, but that's sort of what she was asking. Um, what do I do if, if I'm, I don't feel like I have enough time or bandwidth to go back and redo? Well, let me answer that. So can you do good paintings? Here, here's another way to answer, ask that Jane's question. Can you do good paintings uh, when you can't draw that good? <laughs> Forgive the grammar. English majors, be quiet. Can you, <laughs> can you do good paint? I'm using, I'm using the wrong grammar, so I achieve the parallelism. Can you, can you do good paintings when you can't paint very, when you can't paint very good? When you can't draw very good, when you can't render very accurate, you're not that's not your strong suit. Is uh, you're not that great at. Okay, so l let me answer that because that's that's worth that's worth talking about for a minute. The answer, first of all, is yes. Good news, woohoo! Yes. Um, and so how do you do that? How do you how do you do good paintings? And then let me back up again. Um, Kwang Ho. Really good. I think you could call him a big dog painter. Yeah, probably signature member of OPA Kuang Ho. I can't tell you how to pronounce how to spell his name. I'm sorry. He's Chinese, as you can tell. He's been to been to Raleigh, taught at Nicole's studio several times. I met him a couple times. Um, he says, you know, he sort of doesn't pull any punches. <laughs> He says the most important thing about painting is good drawing. If you can't draw, <laughs> you're sunk. <laughs> the, the number one mistake that will show up in a painting is a drawing error. All right, and essentially he's correct, I believe. That, that, but I'm going to try to I'm going to try to give a, a on the other hand to, to that. So I certainly don't disagree with them. I'm just going to try to say answer Jane's question. So what do you do? All right. The answer is, how can you be a good painter if you can't draw good? And the answer is, you have to be a good abstract painter first. What, pray tell, is a good abstract painter? Well, I'm glad, so glad you asked. And the answer is not that difficult. Uh, how do you be a good abstract painter? 
The answer is by understanding at a deep gut level, like you need to, you need to internalize this. You need to understand all of the all. <laughs> it's not that long a list, but understanding them is the issue. You need to understand the principles of design, line, shape, color, design, value, texture, and read as many books, take as many classes, follow follow as many YouTube teachers as you need to, till you till a light bulb comes on and you go, oh. I get it. What really makes a beautiful painting beautiful is line, shape, color, design, value, texture, blah, 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 blah. That's what really, it's the paint that makes it a beautiful painting, it turns out. Again, so in that regard, I agree with grumpy Clement Greenberg over there. Um, so you have to learn the principles of design well enough so that you can execute them without exhausting you know, you have brain power left over f to do some other stuff, okay? So, f first of all, I would say learn how to do good abstract paintings. Composition, we talk about that all the time. Uh, values related to sub composition. Play of light, that's just a, a, a fancy way of talking about the values issue. Um, brush strokes, interesting marks. So, you know, this is not easy i'm not pretending it's easy but it can be done you can you can begin to discern um the difference between good marks and bad ones it's a study it'll take a while um I'm j i just remembered a guy's name if you just if you want to see somebody that i believe does really beautiful um, abstract paintings his name is jonas gerard I can't remember if it's G-I or G-E. I think it's G-I. Jonas G-I Gerard. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, he does, in my opinion, and evidently a lot of other people's opinion too, he does really beautiful, purely abstract paintings. Find people like that. So does here locally in our city, Bob Rankin, likewise, does really beautiful abstract paintings. Uh, another one, a local friend is uh, Joe DiGiulio, and you will see some similarity between, <laughs> not, not incidentally or accidentally, you'll see some similarity between um, Bob Rankin and Joe DiGiulio. Joe took classes from Bob <laughs> and was a good student, and basically took up Bob's technique, mantle, if you will, and uh, does a similar, roughly similar. Now, let me, besides talking about what are, I consider to be good abstract paintings, uh, I'm not going to name names, I don't think. Oh, yeah, well, sure, I'll name a few. <laughs> there are, there's a whole, there are vast hordes of abstract painters who do, in my opinion, horrible work. Now, uh, some of them, we, they do horrible work because they don't know what they're doing. Some of them do horrible work because they're intentional and philosophical and they're trying to preach sermons at you. And essentially the sermon that many of them are preaching is that life sucks, reality sucks, we're all screwed, life is one horrible, dreadful mistake. The entire cosmos would be better if the cosmos didn't exist. Be better if human beings didn't were on the planet. Stuff like that. And uh, and uh, much of the very very upper echelon, like uh, Clement Greenberg, would would love that stuff. Uh, it's taken me a long time to figure out why. Well, the, the, I'm sorry, and I don't want to get off forever. But let me let me finish this thought. Um, a lot there are a lot of people that do ugly ugly abstract work. Again, because that is their philosophical worldview, and the the art critic world calls them honest. See, they, they would not like the art critics would not like my abstract paintings or any of the ones I just mentioned to you, because the ones I just mentioned to you are all myself, Jonas Gerard, Bob Rankin, Joe DiGiulio, and many others are <laughs> hell bent on doing beautiful paintings. <laughs> <laughs> to use an ironic 
twist of language. Um, and, and it is, in fact, the beauty is what irritates, you know, the Clement Greenberg crowd. He's been long dead. I'm not, I'm not talking about his, his ilk, the university crowd. Anyway, so if you want to learn how to do good abstract painter, paintings, number one, <laughs> start feeding yourself on beautiful abstract paintings, not the ugly ones. So don't look at the ugly ones. Okay, the, the, the world of art is divided into two camps. The, the preachy, political, propagandistic world who believes the purpose of art is to communicate messages. And then, in my, in my opinion, the other half of the art world is people who are trying to create beauty. Okay, when beauty is um, terribly out of style. In, in the academy, okay? Not, and that's why things like ateliers have, have mushroomed around the world in the last quarter of a century. Um, so there's, there are those who are trying to communicate stuff and, and what they're always communicating is it's the same. I, and when I was reading, writing my book a couple years ago, I called it the Dirty Dozen. And I actually have 12 topics that are favorites of that crowd. Um, in the last several years, I've discovered that the Dirty Dozen actually has a categorical name, and it's called Cultural Marxism. So anyway, that's, that's what they're intent on communicating to you. Again, grumpy, grumpy, pessimistic cultural Marxist crap. And that's what I think about that. All right. So don't ignore that. If you want to learn how to do abstract paintings, quit looking at ugly abstract paintings. Um, and I, sure, I'll name names. Um, famous. Uh, and we can differ on this. And, and I, I say this you know, cautiously. But Willem de Kooning, he's, he was an attitude with a brush. That's all. Uh, Michael Basquiat, who not accidentally, co I mean, not coincidentally, died of a drug overdose at age 27. He was an attitude, he was an angry attitude with a brush who got sucked up into cultural Marxist meth messaging. And uh, he's, he's painting sell for millions of dollars because he's a darling of that crowd. Uh, but he does a a a outrageously ugly, ugly, ugly artwork. See, so there's your clue. So there, are, there. Are, stay away from that. Don't pay any. If you want to learn how to do good paintings, then now if you want to be preacher, if you want to be a preacher and a propagandist and a politician, knock yourself out, man. Maybe that's why you're put on the planet. I don't know, but I have nothing to do other than to criticize. I have nothing to do with that that segment of the quote unquote art world. Okay, is that making sense? So if you, first of all, start looking at beautiful paintings. Start learn how to do beautiful abstract paintings, and then. Little by little, begin <laughs> begin folding in <laughs> uh, bits of image, and and go ahead and cheat if you need to. Trace, project, grid, you know whatever you need to do to to get the job done. If you if you want a realistic, so that's that is very much what I recommend. If if you want to be um, a good painter and you don't have time to go back and do the first half of your art journey. Then focus on interesting marks, play of light, color balance, hard and soft edges, composition, all of those rules, all of those guidelines, okay? And you can find those, you can find a good teacher who teaches beautiful abstract painting, follow them. And then as you can, if you want to be a representational painter, then begin to work in little by little representational bits um, I don't know if this looks like fun to you what I'm doing right now but it's great fun to me let me see you want a chat going on
no, this painting, Lady Grant, I think I've made that clear, right? This is not abstract realism. This is first half of life realism. <laughs> Way to go, Lady Grammy. Yay, happy Boxing Day. Yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Jane. I was talking about you earlier. Did you hear me? <laughs> hey, David. <laughs> well, thank you. I, you may be right. You certainly may be right. Um, about my past life as a preacher. Um, this is not a. This is not a permanent change. Now, here, here's a. I, I think I've said this before. Okay, so what happens if I do a? If I were to do a storytelling painting, fantasy painting like this, and suddenly, you know, I become all the rage, say, say in Finland and China, and I just can't keep up with selling prints and originals. What would I do? Well, heck, I. <laughs> <laughs> just to just to <laughs> let you know what planet I live on. I'd follow the money, man. I I I would. <laughs> could I stand? Could I bring myself as an art artiste? <laughs> that's that's the artist salute. Did did y'all see that? By the way, that's the art the artiste salute. <laughs> could I bring myself to paint kitsch? Say. in order to make money <laughs> and my answer is heck yeah what if <laughs> what, what do you think I mean hey, let's just imagine let's, let's just imagine here's a fun thing to imagine let's just imagine I suddenly hit get rich and famous like my friend Drew Blair did he made over a million dollars on one airbrush painting back in 1990 over a million dollars on one painting never sold a painting just sold prints like 16,000 prints at Fifty-five dollars each, or something. I don't. You do the math. Something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, what would I do? Oh, I would, I would do that. I would pay my bills. I would pay my mortgage. I, I would get out of debt. I would, <laughs> I would do. All, and then, what would I do? And and I do believe I would do this. Unlike, so to speak, what our dear old friend Thomas Kincaid did, who stayed stuck in that money wake making. Now, he was a good painter. Now he always makes me a little bit sad because he had he was a really good painter. Don't let any grump ass art critic tell you otherwise. Um, but I, you know, ten, twenty, thirty, forty million evidently wasn't enough. <laughs> and I really do believe that that uh, I would stop at enough is enough and. And then on my own time, so to speak, well, while I was making a million dollars a year, I would do good painting on the side. And in fact, I think I'd have more time to do good painting because I wouldn't be fighting the wolf at the door, if, if you know what I mean. But anyway, the chances of that happen are pretty, pretty minimal. <laughs> but could I bring myself to do, you know, Purdy pictures, if the money was in it. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> Ain't stupid. <laughs> well, it's partly because I'm not an artiste, right? I'm, I'm here partly to pay my bills. Partly. I just am very, very blessed in that I get, I get to do what I love to pay my bills. So, anyway. I ramble perhaps too much. So I'm, I'm just playing with stuff. I'm, I'm playing with what would it look like if a cosmic waterfall. <laughs> Nobody's ever seen one of these, so, you know, we're, we're guessing. What would it look like for a cosmic waterfall to come down into a terrestrial atmosphere? Or it might look something like this. Again. It's what I call storytelling art. It's realism of a sort, right? The effects that I'm trying to create, I want to, 
I want to create a believable looking waterfall. And by the way, I'm not, all this needs work. Um, again, I started this painting in, in, uh, in acrylics. So that as I painted in front of the people, um, it was all acrylics and now I'm in oil. Um, but let me tell you where, where I'm going. W one of the last things I'm going to do, maybe the last thing I'm going to do with this painting is uh, wait for all of this to dry. It's in oil. And then redo the stars. So that it's important that the, all of this is thoroughly dry. And then I will take the canvas out in my front yard or backyard, or not the driveway, because <laughs> I don't spatter paint all over the driveway. But I will take it out to the front yard, lay it down, and go out there with my white paint and uh, some medium and some Gamsol and so on and some chip brushes, and I will spatter that. Uh, I've talked about that before. If I if I remember, if I have the opportunity, I will broadcast that because that could be that could be quite instructive for some of you. This is what I'm telling you is how to spatter a painting. Okay? The answer is wait till it's dry. Of course, in acrylics, that's just a few minutes. Same thing is true for acrylics. Um, because you can't control the spatter, right? That's half the beauty of, of spattering is you can't control it. Um, so you take it outside where you won't get paint all over everything and you stand up and you go fwak. <laughs> That's the name. F-W-O-K. Fwak. <laughs> you fwak it. <laughs> and um, if it turns out perfect with the very first fwak, <laughs> then you are a lucky person. The chances of that happening are minimal. Almost minuscule. So you have a rag there already soaked in Gamsol, or if you're working in acrylics, it's even more critical. You have a damp rag there ready to go because your first flock <laughs> didn't turn out so good. Oh, like not nah, too big, too small, too many, too few, too, you know, whatever. So you wipe it all off. Do you understand now why it's important that it's all dry? And then you flock it again. <laughs> and little by little, you begin to say, oh, look, it works really well when I do this. Doesn't work so well when I do that. So you work, you work it out, you, you, you get better at it. And after 5, 10, 15 minutes of flocking in, <laughs> in the front yard, <laughs> you are an expert flocker. And you walk in, come back in the house with your painting with beautiful spatter. People wonder, how did you get that spatter so perfect? And now you know the answer. And then the very last thing that I will do um, on, on both of these paintings, the, the one I did Tuesday, this one Thursday and the one I did Tuesday on both of them. I don't know yet if I'm going to go to oil on Tuesday's painting, Christmas Eve painting. I may just stay in acrylics in that one. We'll see. Um, then the very last thing that I'll do is I'll get out the airbrushes again and uh, with white oil in the airbrush, I will do um, atmosphere around some of the stars. Okay, so let me just again, and I, I, I talked about this a little bit the other day on Christmas Eve, I think, for some of you. Um, how to do, and there's some like that's a mistake that needs to be fixed. How to do a beautiful starry you know, like Hubble telescope stubble, uh, uh, starry night, um, starry sky. Um, the answer is spatter, let it dry, then do what you do, you do dark blue first. Spatter, let it dry, then you dark, dark blue transparent on top of that spatter, right? So these stars, I don't know if you can see these that are like here that are dark blue. Those used to be white, and then I did blue on top of them. So now they're blue, so they recede. And I've done the same thing, that exact same thing twice. The, the things that look white here are not white, they're pale blue. So then when I come back and do true white, and it will be pure titanium white with my flocking, <laughs> with my spattering, those, so we get a dimension then. We get stars that are, also by the way, I have a, 
a bunch of orange stars over here, some green ones over here, whoops, over here, and some orange ones here. So different colored stars, but layers. Bup, 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 bup. Now that's a surprise, isn't it? You would never expect Dan to say, what, layers? Okay, I'm being facetious for you newcomers. Everything I do is in layers, including my cosmic stars. Okay, layer, 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 layer. Anyway, and then the, the very last thing that I will do will be um, this kind of stuff, airbrush, pss, pss, around some of those stars so we get a little bit of what looks like atmosphere, which of course is completely scientific ridiculous. There's no atmosphere around stars, but there are cloud nebula and somehow, you know, Hubble and all the other uh, science or, or science fiction, either one, uh, photographs have taught us to have taught us to view stars in that manner that many of them have a glow around them. Anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. And if you miss it, at least you know where I'm going with it. So part of the fun, part of the story fun here is that the, the waterfall is coming, the God waterfall is coming from the cosmos into the atmosphere. And then I want it to appear as though it's coming from the sky, actually down, right, the water of life, if you will. coming down in, onto the world, into the earth. And then from the earth into the these cities. And I am just about out of time, folks, so I uh, uh, we are going to uh, my wife and I and, and the kids are driving to Greenville, hour and a half from here, Greenville, North Carolina, to visit my mostly my brother, Steve, who is visiting from Japan. So very, very, very special. He's, he's there because that's where my mom lives with my older sister, with our older sister. So we're going to go have more Christmas with my mom, who's 94, bless her, and my... Uh, Brother Steve, who is not 94. <laughs> In fact, my brother Steve and I share a birthday. He was born on my third birthday. That was always kind of special growing up. To my birthday, we were, there were two of us that were having a birthday on the same day. I liked that right, right much as a kid. Okay, tell you what, before I go, let, let me do one more thing. And that is uh, w one more layer of, of white, whiter highlights here in this waterfall sunset. what he says and then he just keeps painting okay that's good enough then he keeps painting all right that's good enough then he keeps painting all right that's good enough <laughs> one of these minutes i will quit all right when i come back in a couple days i'll look at all of this through fresh eyes of course and uh, it may very well make a number of changes the most likely of which, or additions or changes, the most likely of which will be um, that I will do a glaze or glazes over um, 
either the whole canvas or significant areas on the canvas. All right. Any other chats I need to see? <laughs> Oh, Jane, you missed. I was talking about you. I was talking about if you're still here, if you're still listening. Um, I was talking about the question you asked about um, f first half of art life, second half. Well, can you can you can you skip ahead? And I was answering yes. You have to learn how to be a good abstract painter first, and then introduce, fold in little bits of realism and cheat if you need to, grit, uh, grid, project, trace, whatever you need to do, all the while, uh, well, so to speak, on your own time, if you will, while you're learning how to draw with your sketchbook and sketch pads and so on. Um, so you learn how to draw always. That's good. One of the best things you can do for your brain is look at stuff and copy it, no matter how old you are. Um, so do that. Learn how to draw. Study drawing, as I do all the time. Well, not, you know what I mean, all the time, continually. Um, speaking of which, I'm teaching an anatomy course this fall. You guys will be able to get in on that. Uh, it's a local thing, but I'll be broadcasting much of it. Um, anyway, so I'm very excited about that. I've already started brushing up on my anatomy, ordered a couple of new books, watching more videos, just practicing, learning, refreshing my, I'm giving myself a refresher course on anatomy. So anyway, I'm doing exactly the same thing I'm telling you to do. Um, keep learning how to draw. All right, I'll call that a day. Looks like fun. I look forward to coming back to it later. You know, when I, now that I'm looking at it, sort of standing back and looking with fresh eyes, here's what I tell you to do. I like it pretty much. That's what you have to say, right? I just wish it was more red. Or, another way to put it that, I like it pretty much. There's just a little bit too much green. I don't know if that's, yeah, I think it's coming through on your monitor. A little, little too much green. Not, not, it's like, Oh, it's, like I it. why, why, it's too green. No, 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 no. I like it pretty much. I just was, wish it was more anti-green, which means red. So, uh, again, probably a very thin glaze of permanent rose. I have a little bit of purple up here. I'll play off on that and bring, bring that in here, a little bit more red down here. I'm talking about when this is dry in a couple days, and I come back and do glazes on top of it. Beyond that, I have no idea. I like my columnar junipers here now. And I like my palm trees. My shepherd needs a lot of work, but that's no problem. That's, that's a small brush. Tongue painting right there. All right. Thanks, guys. Been fun. Good, Jane. Yeah, I talked good about you. <laughs> Go back and listen. <laughs> All right. Thanks, y'all. Love you. Bye.